This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Nelson Rockefeller stared into a sea of hate. Standing at the podium of the Republican National Convention of 1964, the 56-year-old patrician politician who symbolized dynastic American power and wealth was enveloped by waves of anger emanating from the party faithful. Delegates and activists assembled in the Cow Palace on the outskirts of San Francisco hurled boos and catcalls at the New York governor. He was the enemy. His crime, representing the liberal Republican establishment that, to the horror of many in the audience, had committed two unpardonable sins. First, in the aftermath of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, these turncoat, weak-kneed Republicans had dared to acknowledge the need for big government programs to address the problems and challenges of an industrialized and urbanized United States. Second, they had accepted the reality that the Cold War of the new nuclear age demanded a nuanced national security policy predicated on a carefully measured combination of confrontation and negotiation. Worse, Rockefeller had tried to thwart the hero of the moment, Barry Goldwater, the arch-conservative senator from Arizona, the libertarian decrier of government the tough-talking scolder of America's moral rot, and the hawkish proponent of military might who had advocated the limited use of nuclear arms. Rockefeller, a grandson of billionaire robber baron John D. Rockefeller, had competed for the presidential nomination against Goldwater, but his campaign had been subsumed by the right wing's takeover of the party. Still, at this late stage on July 14th, the second night of Goldwater's coronation, Rockefeller and other moderate Republican dead-enders were praying for a last-minute political miracle that would rescue their party from the conservative fringe, the kooks, as they were widely called. This evening, they were taking one final stab at keeping those kooks at bay. Clenching his square jaw, Rockefeller had hit the stage with an immediate task, to speak in favor of a proposed amendment to the Republican Party platform denouncing extremism, specifically that of the Communist Party, the Ku Klux Klan, and the ultra-conservative red-baiting John Birch Society. The platform committee, controlled by Goldwater loyalists, had rejected this resolution, yet the moderates hadn't given up. On the opening night of the convention, Governor Mark Hatfield of Oregon had declared, There are bigots in this nation who spew forth their venom of hate. They parade under hundreds of labels, including the Communist Party, the Ku Klux Klan, and the John Birch Society. They must be overcome. That was not the predominant sentiment within the Cow Palace. Hatfield was met with a barrage of hisses and boos. He later called the response frightening and reflected, It spoke to me not merely of strong political disagreement, but of a spiteful kind of enmity, waiting to be unleashed to destroy anyone seen as the enemy, domestic or foreign. The delegates were strident anti-communists. Many feared evil Reds were subverting the government and the nation's most revered institutions, and for them, Goldwater was the leader of a do-or-die crusade against leftism. They would eagerly back a resolution reviling commies, and though the grand old party founded a century earlier by anti-slavery politicians was now actively moving to court racist southern voters opposed to desegregation and civil rights, they might disavow the Klan. But including the John Birch Society in this lineup of extremists, to be deplored, was a not-subtle-at-all dig at Goldwater and his fanatic followers. Everyone in the room knew what and who this resolution was aimed at. Founded in 1958 by Robert Welch, 
a one-time candy manufacturer. The John Birch Society was the most prominent exponent of right-wing conspiratorial paranoia. It proselytized that the commies were everywhere, in secret control of the U.S. government and subverting many of America's most cherished organizations, schools, churches, the media, and PTAs. Welch had even fingered Dwight Eisenhower, the World War II hero who served two terms as president as a Soviet asset. Though many Americans might have looked upon it as a fringe outfit, the kookiest of the kooks, the John Birch Society and its members were mightily assisting the Goldwater effort as volunteers and funders. Though Goldwater, under much pressure, had distanced himself from Welch, he had not disavowed the society and its members. His once improbable path to the GOP presidential nomination had been fueled by the paranoid passions of the Birchers and other far-right conservatives. The Goldwater Zealots in the Cow Palace, a project of FDR's Works Progress Administration, originally built as a livestock pavilion, were sure as hell not going to let Rocky and those establishment Republicans vilify and ostracize this crucial component of the Goldwater Coalition.